Anyone remember that song? <laughs> I think just written straight from God to us. And um, every time I hear it, I think about him and his love for us and how simple it really is and how difficult we make it and how difficult the world makes it for us. Um, my apologies to the online community. If you got kicked off, you can't even hear me for that. But uh, thanks for indulging us. Nice. We weren't good enough. They didn't think it was. <laughs> they didn't think it was the real song. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, I think I'd like to pray it real quick before we uh, before we jump in. Lord, thank you so much that you do love us. God, forgive us for not remembering that so many times in life. Forgive us for shifting our focus away from that simple fact that changes the way that we interact with the world. Lord, I pray that you would help us to tune our hearts to you, to see you, to hear you, and to allow you to work your spirit through us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, it'll come no surprise, as no surprise to you, that uh, I'm going to tell you about a movie this morning that some of you maybe haven't seen. If you haven't seen it and you don't like a certain four-letter word that starts with an F, then don't see it, okay? I'm not recommending that you jump, jump out of here today and go check out this movie, but um, it is one of my favorite movies, and I think it presents an illustration that, to me, really demonstrates what life is all about for us. And so the movie is Pulp Fiction. It is the second Quentin Tarantino film, which should tell you enough if you're not sure if you're going to check it out. Um, it was the first major motion picture with a mixed up order, you know, really like the first one in my lifetime. I don't know, maybe in the 50s, 60s they did it. But a totally mixed up story where the opening scene is actually, you find out at the end of the movie, the end of the movie. So you open the movie in the closing scene, and then you work your way through the, uh, to the end of the movie to get back to the beginning. And the movie follows the lives of two mob hitmen, a boxer, a gangster, and his wife, and a pair of bandits that are robbing a diner. And that story kind of intertwines throughout the journey that you go on in the movie. We're gonna talk this morning about the two mob hitmen. And uh, that was John Travolta and Sam Jackson. No surprise, Sam Jackson's in there. Um, there they are. And uh, so they are mob hitmen who, and their, their names are Vincent Vega and Jules Winfield. Jules is Sam Jackson's character. Jules and Vince have been sent to retrieve a briefcase for their boss, Marcellus Wallace. We don't know what's in the briefcase, it's a big debate, but let's just say it's valuable enough that a couple hitmen came to get it. Um, in the apartment of the young guys, in over their heads, because they're trying to hide this case from this mobster, and now the hitmen have come up to get it, they have a colorful exchange, very colorful exchange, with them about the whereabouts of the suitcase. One of the kids is hiding in the bathroom with a gun, and at one point he pops out of the bathroom and empties a gun in the direction of Jules and Vince, missing them completely. And they stop for a moment. Jules turns around and looks at all the holes in the wall behind him, and they turn around and take care of business. And uh, they start a discussion. Jules says to Vince, we should be dead, man. And Vince says, I know, we was lucky. No, 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 says Jules, this isn't luck. This was divine intervention. Do you know what divine intervention is? And Vince says, stops, slowly turns and says, I think so. It means God came down from heaven and stopped the bullets? Jules says, yes, that's right. God came down from heaven and stopped these bullets. Vince argues a little that maybe it wasn't quite the miracle that Jules thinks he saw, and Jules gets irritated and demands, Vincent, this is a miracle, and I want you to acknowledge what we saw here. I want you to acknowledge that this was a miracle. And he says, okay, okay, it was a miracle. Do you want to continue this theological discussion in the car or in a jail cell with the police? 
because they still haven't taken care of getting the case and getting out of the scene. They just shot the kid. And uh, so they, they leave the apartment. And uh, on the way out, Jules decides that he's going to leave the life as a result of this miracle that he saw. So why am I telling you about Pulp Fiction in church? It's a good question, except if you consider the source. Um, anyone who knows me knows that I see God everywhere, and not just where religious folks tell me that I should see him. I rarely see him there as much as I see him elsewhere. The story of the cross moves through all of our space time and the work accomplished on it is not dependent on us to communicate it. The work is finished, it's done, it's complete. The work accomplished on the cross also moves through all of our space time unhindered by, our, uh, by us or by the prince of this world. The title that Jesus gave to Satan while he was here talking with his disciples. The work of that cross is unhindered by us, and it is also unhindered by the work of the prince of this world. Last week, Peter made a new slide that I really liked. This creation, salvation, judgment series that he talked about, that kind of order that we traditionally hear of the universe, that creation was first, right, Genesis, then salvation, you get to the cross in the Gospels, and then you get to judgment in the revelation of the Christ, right at the end of the story, quote unquote. Um, God taking vengeance on us is that story, in my opinion. That's what that story emulates. It's what it models. It's what it's been turned into. God taking vengeance on us. Well, Peter postulated last week that perhaps we've got the order wrong and the one below it is more correct, that judgment happened then salvation, and then creation. And to me, what I heard when I heard him say that, and we'll get into the specifics of the whole linear thing, but it makes more sense that way to me because that to me is not God taking vengeance on us. That is a story that shows God imparting his righteousness on us, his creation. The beginning is the end and vice versa, just like the movie. It's important to keep in mind space-time and quantum physics here as much as you know about them. Remember the concept of the Flatlanders that Peter talked about? Fantastic videos online. If you've not checked that out, you should. The whole concept of Flatland and dimensions is really quite something to check out. The fourth through 11th dimensions is where you turn the video off. You'll be like, that's okay. I got the third, but uh, I don't know what's happening now. But Keeping that in mind and keeping in mind that the work on this cross is moving in, it's moving outside, around, and through our linear time frame all the time. God's economy functions differently than ours. I've said that before, but it's a dangerous statement because the Catholic Church turns God, turned God's economy into a different thing. But what I mean by that is the resources that God calls upon, the things that are produced in the economy of God are different than the things that are produced in our economy, right? So they're not houses and money and things of that nature. Maybe sometimes they are as a gift, whatever. Might be a green light here, a green light there. But it's typically other things like the fruits of the Spirit, those types of things that you see that come directly from the Holy Spirit through us and into the world. So I think I had another slide. Yeah, Peter made this one. I really liked it a lot. Um, judgment, salvation, creation, it's a work, right? There are roots, there are leaves, there's a tree, there's a man. As a young non-Christian, my number one issue that remained unanswered by my Christian friends, especially... Um, well, it just remained un unanswered all the way through, was suffering. It was both the suffering that we see in the world around us and especially eternal conscious torment or just the concept of a large portion of people being created simply to go to hell for eternity, for eternity. There's, that's a big differentiator there. Um, I simply couldn't and quite honestly, still can't trust an omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent being who sets such a flawed plan in motion. If God knew in advance the suffering that would be unleashed and the penalty that would have to be paid et eternally, but went forward with creation, in my mind, he was an abhorrent monster. 
he was worse than Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong, and the Assyrian Empire all combined, in my opinion. I resolved early on to not let that issue get between me and God, to not let some statements or decisions that were made about God by people get between myself and the living God. And I refused to let the decisions of mankind fuel my view of God, recognizing that he is always bigger than we think, right? I'm glad that John reminded of us, that, us of that again this morning. Last week, as Peter spoke, he resolved this issue for me. I had an aha moment um, where I thought, I can trust an omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent being who sets a plan in motion, having already satisfied the problem of evil. Understanding that our limited knowledge and experience in our linear time and flat, our flat land prevents us from fully understanding the details of this. That paradigm shift resolves my problem with God, which was really the problem with evil, right? The problem of evil. We're not moving judgment and creation around. We're simply acknowledging that judgment happened and is happening in conjunction with creation. So it isn't so linear as much as it is the idea that, as Peter says, they're all essentially the same thing. God's judgment is his mercy. If I have heard Peter say one thing a hundred million times, it's that. And it, it, it stays here. It moves from here to here quickly and it stays here. God's judgment is his mercy. God's, God's vengeance is his righteousness. This. My sorrow for the world, for the people of the world, for the pain that we experience, literally turns to joy if I just remember God loves me. This is where the Trinity is so important. We are Trinitarian here. We do believe in the Trinity, the Trinity and that the Father loves us, that Jesus showed us how to live in that love, and the Holy Spirit was sent as a helper to help us live in that love. Much like we can't really understand how God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are the same but separate entities. We struggle with that, right? We've killed people over it in the past, not us, but the, uh, the church. Um, <laughs> we shy away from that these days. Um, <laughs> right, yeah, we don't have, we're too small. We need bigger numbers if we're going to go to war over this issue. Uh, no. <laughs> um, all right, so much like we have trouble understanding that, that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are the same but separate entities, we really have trouble understanding how judgment, salvation, and creation could all be the same thing but separate things at the same time. And it has to do with that fourth dimension, time, as long as scientists still agree in the future that the fourth dimension is time. Maybe they won't, maybe they will. For now it is, so we'll roll with that. So let's talk about judgment for a little while. Everybody loves that topic. Um, anybody want to dish some? No. <laughs> um, so Jules in this movie has this saying, this speech that he gives before he offs somebody as a hitman. And he titles it Ezekiel 25:17. Now it is not Ezekiel 25:17, so it will not be on the screen because this is not scripture. This is actually from a Kung Fu movie, and Quentin Tarantino stole it from a Kung Fu movie. But, but he says this to someone before he shoots them, essentially, as a hitman. The path, he says, Ezekiel 25, 17, the path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. Blessed is he who in the name of charity and goodwill shepherds the weak through the valley of darkness, for he is truly his brother's keeper and the finder of lost children. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who attempt to poison and destroy my brothers. And you will know my name is the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon thee. That's his big statement. That last part is Ezekiel 25, 17. Um, God's judgment, though, is his mercy. And I am telling you this so that we can dig into that a little bit more. His kindness is what leads us to repentance, not his vengeance. And remember that repentance is not the one-time event we've been sold, in my opinion. It is, uh, I had an old co-worker who used to like, he's an old pastor, he used to like to say, it's like driving down the highway one direction and then you get off on an exit ramp and you go back the other direction. Okay, maybe. That freeway in my mind looks way different. It has a lot of off-ramps uh, because I look at, 
I look at uh, repentance as more of a two steps forward, one step back type of situation for myself. I don't know about you guys. Maybe he's way better off than I am. Um, a constant and continuous process of varying lengths depending on my ability to surrender to the Holy Spirit in my life. That's repentance for me. I don't have the time or the talent let alone the patience to break apart the issue of God's vengeance in Ezekiel this morning. I'll leave that to Peter. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but I do want to point out a couple of things. Paul told us in Romans that vengeance is the Lord's, right? That was in Romans, yes. Not ours. It does not belong to us. It is not our concern. It is God's concern. Remember that I believe that God's vengeance is his righteousness. And I believe that Peter believes that as well. I believe that's what we preach at the sanctuary. Jules's, Jules' vengeance that he's offering in that moment as a hitman is not for the purpose of repentance. That vengeance, when he starts his speech, he knows that the end will also be the end of the person that he's, that's hearing it, at least here in this space time. So it's a picture of what vengeance looks like in the hands of humanity, I think. It's a picture of what vengeance looks like in our hands. At the end of the movie, we come back to the diner that's at the beginning, and we're back at the scene, and we find out that Vincent and Jules are dining in the diner that's getting robbed. So at this time, we learn um, Jules turns the table on the robbers, and with one of them at gunpoint, whose name is Ringo, Jules tells him, you can't have this case. I'm taking this case back to my boss today, and it's going to get back to him. But you can have my wallet. So he tells him to get in the bag and get his wallet out. And he says, you take it. There's a good amount of money in there. I want you to have it. But I'm not just giving it to you. I'm buying something with it, he tells him. I'm buying your life. Because... He, and then he asks him, do you read the Bible, Ringo? And of course, the guy's robbing a diner. I mean, he's like, well, not regularly. Um, but he, he's, he says, I've been saying this, uh, or, oh, I've got this saying that I, you know, that I like to tell someone be, right before I take their life. And it's Ezekiel 25, 17. He goes through the whole passage again. And he says, I've been saying that for years. And if you've heard it, it meant your ass. <laughs> you were done. I never gave much thought to what it meant. I just thought it was some cold-blooded things to say before I killed someone. I saw some things this morning made me think twice. And he runs through some possible meanings of what those parts and pieces of the Ezekiel passage could be. But he comes down to telling the guy in front of him, but the truth is that you're the weak and I'm the tyranny of evil men. But I'm trying, Ringo, I'm trying real hard to be the shepherd. And he uncocks his gun and he tells him to take his bag and leave. Well, this scene of vengeance versus righteousness, I wanted to just dig into a little bit because I think, um, you know, if we look at the meaning of vengeance, it's the act or desire for taking revenge, it's retributive punishment. And righteousness is the noun for the quality of being morally right or justifiable. I think vengeance has more to do with being made righteous, not made right. That has a really ugly look in our culture today, but made righteous through this righteousness, not to satisfy our own desire to be justified. God's vengeance is not our concern. He does not need us to ensure that it is dispensed properly or justly. He's got that. He's got it. I got you, as the 20-year-olds say these days. A visible example of this playing out is the disciples' complete inability to fully understand what Jesus is doing and why. They are constantly trying to squeeze the glimpses that they get of what he's doing, which is something that exists outside of our space-time, into our space-time and understand it. They're always pulling it in and saying, wow, what, do you think, what do you think he meant by that? I don't know. And sometimes he even hears them and he's like, are you asking yourselves what I meant when I said? And then he tells them, and it's even more unclear at that point. It's total chaos at that point. 
But God doesn't just exist outside. He didn't come down from heaven and stop the bullets. He was already here. If he wanted to alter the course of those bullets, he, he can do it. He's in, around, on, and through our space time. And as a result, in, around, on, and through us. If we're honest, we can see that God's vengeance is his right. His righteousness is poured out on all of us continually. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper into one verse today from 1 Peter from last week. And it is 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trials when it comes, when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. When his glory is revealed is an interesting statement here, I think. Um, Traditionally, I think we teach that to mean a certain time and place in our linear time, in our linear space time. But his glory is constantly being revealed in our space time. If it exists in, on, and around us, it's constantly being revealed. A surrendered life is a constant revealing of his glory. You've seen Peter's timeline. This is, that's what that says. Like, that makes that possible. Because it doesn't exist just on the line. It's outside, inside, through, and around, and on the line. The fiery trials are not something strange happening to you when you understand that the pain and suffering of this world is ultimately overcome by this, the cross, is overcome. As a parent, I would never wish pain and suffering on my kids, but I know that as they grow, it's going to be a part of their experience. I pray that it doesn't drive them, but rather that they will submit to and be driven by God or the good in the midst of those struggles and trials, that they will listen and hear the Holy Spirit and that they will let the Holy Spirit guide them. It's when we remember that God loves us that sorrow turns to joy. I'm suggesting that that phrase, that's a tough phrase, sorrow turning to joy. It depends on the depth of the sorrow, right? Or the the details around the sorrow. I get that. But I'm suggesting that perhaps it's a shift of perspective, a shift of focus, rather than just a linear event that happens, and I turned around on the freeway and drove the other way. Well, somebody might hit me (laughs) going the other way, right? I mean, it's still possible. Perhaps it's happening all the time. Sorrows here in our space-time maybe aren't as sorrowful from a broader perspective. I've talked about this before, and I won't stay here long, but this is an image of the electromagnetic spectrum. shows the range of all types of electromagnetic radiation, which is energy that travels and spreads out as it goes through our, where we are here in space and time. The, notice the tiny sliver that's visible to humans. It's that little colored stripe that goes up, and then it's, it's bigger down below so you can see it. But there's so much in the electromagnetic spectrum that's there that we know is there that we can't see. Gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet rays, infrared rays, radar, FM, TV, um, whatever else is down there. (laughs) So the rest of the stuff is in, on, around, and through us continually. Going back to that previous timeline, that's what that means, right? Notice the way that light travels I don't know if it's up there, but you'll see it in a minute if it isn't. It travels in waves. So we're going to talk about salvation now for a little bit. Jesus' death on the cross is an event that does not change with the placement of judgment and creation. This picture we're all familiar with. I love this picture. Jesus is our righteousness. He doesn't provide our righteousness. He literally is our righteousness. His righteousness flows out in, around, and through us from his cross. A comedian that I love, Pete Holmes, says, uh, there's nothing that we can do to increase or decrease the flow of God's love. And that's what that righteousness is. There's plenty that we can do to increase and decrease our awareness of it. 
but there's nothing that we can do to increase or decrease the flow of God's love, God's righteousness. We can't guide it to those whom we choose, nor should we desire to. The cross of Christ makes us all righteous in the end. During this life, we ebb and flow between righteousness and unrighteousness in our space-time as we're being created. We're, we're enduring the birth pains of creation. We're being created. This is true for everyone, regardless of what they tell you. So a light wave. In this space-time, the righteousness of Jesus is not about my righteousness. That's Mises. Although his righteousness, when it flows through me, may sometimes look like my righteousness. It may. But the minute that I think it is my righteousness, the very minute I'm back at this tree, not to surrender, but to take more knowledge of good and evil, if I'm proud of his righteousness inside me, it isn't counted to me as righteousness. If I'm grateful for his righteousness inside me, it is counted to me as righteousness. If I remember that God loves me and acknowledge that it's not me alone, I'm also back at the tree, but this time to surrender and to receive more life, true life. Working to earn salvation does not result in living, I don't believe. Not true living. Working to save others does not result in living, I don't believe. True living. Working to look better than others doesn't result in living. Truly living. The wave I didn't get to, but I believe that that's, our, that's what my repentance looks like. It's, uh, it's a pretty, pretty consistent flow ebbing back and forth between myself and this righteousness and surrender and non-surrender. And so now we come to creation, where we literally spend our time <laughs> here in creation. What is the meaning of life besides a fantastic movie? Why are we here? I think we're here because we're learning to walk with God, period. One of the characters of the Bible who has always interested me is Mr. Enoch. He was the great-grandfather of Noah. Tradition is what interests me here. Tradition has created an entire ecology around this man from what very little we know of him. So we're going to read everything we know about Enoch right now. Genesis chapter 5. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. What a solid name. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. The writer of Hebrews tells us a little bit about him. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Essentially, from that information, you can find all kinds of articles, books, sermons. I didn't write this down, but I saw one last night. Conferences around Enoch. Enoch. It's kind of strange, I think. Um, I think it's interesting to note here that Genesis tells us something similar about Noah. Genesis chapter 6 tells us, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with Noah's story. But suffice it to say, he was a flawed man. There were some struggles there. Blameless in his generation, and he walked with God. So apparently that phrase must not point to perfection, which, again, if you work with me, you'll hear this a lot, is the lowest possible standard because it's simply unattainable. Much to the chagrin of my evangelical friends. They don't like it when I say that. Do you suppose that Abraham walked with God? 
Moses, I think he walked with God. David, maybe. So I'm not going to debate the details of Enoch's lifetime today, because it's 365 years, so that would take a while for us to hash out. Um, but let's stop for a minute and think about a 365-year time span. Okay, America was officially founded in 1776. We've got 248 years under our belt. We've got 117 years to go before we reach 365 years as a nation. Do you think much will happen during that time? Let alone what's already happened in the past 247, right? So if you want to argue about the 365-year lifetime, let's just think about his 65 years on earth before he fathered Methuselah. How many details do you suppose are missing from Enoch's life in just that 65-year span of time? I think we might be missing the point here. But anyway, we have a new puppy. Those of you who had a puppy recently groaned, those of you who haven't had a puppy recently said, oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. That's Martha. She's sticking her tongue out at you because that's what she does to us. <sighs> well, we're her trainers, right? And so walking has been a real issue. How many of you have ever seen the show Caesar Malone, the dog whisperer? It's a fantastic show if you haven't seen it. This man is simply a magician with dogs. Like these people have these most unruly dogs you've ever seen in your life. This guy walks in the room and the dog just behaves. It's really, it's kind of sickening to watch, honestly. But ironically, he works less magic with the dogs than he does with the owners. He talks a lot about getting dogs into a calm state of surrender and getting them out of an excited, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know. It's a lot of excitement. I can't talk about it because it's too soon. Um, so getting them out of that excitable state and getting them into a calm surrender is what he's usually striving for. Heather and I saw an amazing episode on walking the dog. Like we saw this dog was pulling really hard, you know, and Caesar's looking at him. He's like, oh my gosh, this is not walking. That dog is fully in charge. It's dragging that person down the street. Of course, cut scene, everything's hunky-dory. The dog's the best behaved dog in the world. I don't know how much time there was between that and that. It seemed like nothing, right? But I, I feel like it was a long <laughs> A lot of suffering was cut out of that story, but Caesar explains the importance of a, of a short but loose leash for walking. A tight leash actually puts a dog into a state of excitement, and they feel like they, they need to get away or out or out from the restraint of that leash. And so as I was watching this episode, I thought, oh my gosh, is this how I walk with God? Am I pulling this hard when I, when I pull on God? Or, or do I stop once in a while and jump up on him and try to redirect him because, hey, dude, you're going the wrong way. The, the house is back there. You know, the dog thinks it knows where I want to go, <laughs> but I'm trying to get it exercise. But it jumps on me and tries to go back. It pulls and it strains and it tries to go forward. Sometimes she runs and literally looks like a reindeer, like in the sky, because we're just can't. Yeah. Um, so, it just reminded me of our call to follow in Jesus' steps because Jesus showed us how to walk with the Father through the Spirit. Jesus provided us an example of how to live walking with God. In 1 Peter, that verse tells us, uh, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Share Christ's sufferings, in so much, in so far as you share Christ's sufferings. It was this word that I knew immediately I was going to talk about this when I spoke, when I heard Peter use the word koinonia, that Greek word. And it, it's interpreted mostly, mainly as to participate in or share in as an associate. And it's talking about this, right? So we share in this righteousness as an associate of that righteousness. It's also a couple of other ways that, that it's talked about is to come into communion with, right, this, 
and to share with others. That's this. And what exactly are Christ's sufferings? Well, aren't they the sufferings of humanity? The groanings of creation, the pains of labor that result in such pain and then such joy? Labor, not fun. New baby, fun-ish. Um, <laughs> depends on how young you are. Um, you know, but you'll go through it again, right? Uh, there's no way. If, if, I, if I were in charge of babies being born, if I were the factory for that, no babies. That's not happening. <laughs> but somehow, it happens again and again and again. We're still being created, and part of that process is learning to walk with God. Learning calm surrender. Now, Peter will point out, as he has much experience with this, and I will say amen that I do not <laughs> at this point. It's not always calm surrender, right? There can be turmoil in that surrender, and, and that is truth. Learning not to pull, learning not to strain, learning not to try to go off on our own, led astray by our focus, our own focus, on what we perceive to be good, but learning to stop asking, what do I get? Learning to stop asking, what do I get for the walk, right? The dog has no idea what we're doing. Uh, I mean, she's starting to figure out the dog park now, and so she does the mental math. What do I get if I, oh, right, we're going to the dog park. Okay, I'll go. What do I get if I go to church, right? What do I get out of it, God? What do I get if, if I pay attention to you today on my walk? Um, I wanted to just remind us real quick that Paul tells us in Romans 8 about the groaning. So in the ESV version of Romans 8, 22, Paul says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. I liked the NIV translation of this a little bit better. Um, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The pains of labor. There's those waves again, right? The light wave. Well, we're going to jump back to Pulp Fiction. So Jules has decided he's going to give up the life, right? Saw a miracle, given up the life. So later in the movie, Vincent and Jules are discussing the miracle again. Vincent says, you saw a miracle, Jules. I saw a freak occurrence. And they have a little talk about, well, what is a miracle? Act of God, blah, blah, blah. And Jules says, you're judging this the wrong way, Vince. Whether or not what we witnessed was an according to Hoyle miracle is insignificant. What is significant is, I felt the touch of God. God got involved. Vincent says, but why? And Jules says a little more colorfully, that's what's messing with me. I don't know why, but I can't go back to sleep. Jules comes up with a plan to walk the earth until God puts him where he wants him to be. Vince says, what do you mean walk the earth? He says, I'm just going to walk the earth. So Vince says to him, so you've decided to be a bum. They got a name for that, Jules. It's called being a bum. And without a job and without a residence or legal tender, that's what you're going to be. You're going to be a bum. And Jules says to him, I'll just be Jules, Vincent. No more, no less. Jules just wants to stop resisting and just walk. I want to take a moment to recognize that I don't share the common belief that walking with God always requires abandoning the track that you're on to go on a new track that you were missing or ignoring before. Sometimes there may be things you need to walk away from. Vince, or I mean Jules, sorry, couldn't continue to be a hitman, for instance. But rarely is it the case that you need to make a hard shift from the work you've been doing to some new work that's more godly. And this would be a message to followers of Christ already, I guess. So there's a difference between street ministry and 
inside church member ministry, right? So a lot of times I have friends who freak out that they haven't been doing the work of God, right? I haven't been doing the, God, the work of God. I've, I've been wasting my time doing this work and I haven't been doing the work of God. I need to go do the work of God. And that's when I, I think, I suspect personally that it's less about doing different things and more about doing things differently. I suspect that part of the problem is the fact that Jesus called the disciples to leave their vocations, right? So we have that as an example. Are we called to leave our, our vocations? It's kind of the same issue for me as are we called to give up all of our possessions and, and walk the earth, right? Or are we simply called to not be possessed by our possessions and not to be defined by our vocations? But with the Holy Spirit as our guide, our actions fall in line with our Father, the good. That part's taken care of. Jules isn't going to walk with God and say, oh, well, I got to hey, hang on a sec, God. You go on ahead, I'll catch up. I got a couple guys I got to take out over here, right? That's just, that's by the way that it works out, it isn't going to work that way. Because that, ven that vengeance doesn't flow through this device. It's the righteousness that flows through this device. The vengeance is here in the world and you can pick it up wherever you are. Reed Kenner is here today. It's awesome to see you. He, uh, he came to BBB last month, and, and he said something that just really stuck with me. He said that your, your call in this world is to impact the people around you, right? The people in your circle of influence. And when you walk away from that calling, you cease to do the very things that you were put here on earth to do. You stop doing what you're called to do when you walk away from that circle. Rick is here. Peter shared with me something that Rick has shared with him. He's also shared it with me. Rick, every day he says, I get up, I go for a walk, and I ask, what can I do for you today, Lord? And you know what God tells him? Hey, Rick, just remember I love you, and it'll be all right. And so look, we're back at the beginning now. Back at judgment. I think we are. Let me see. Maybe not. It's important while we're talking, while we're walking, living life, to remember that God loves us. It's important to remember that you are not vile to him. I have been, I've heard that from the mouths of Christ followers. You're so vile to him that he can't look at you. I don't believe that that's true. And if any one of you is aware of a section of scripture in which Jesus tells his disciples that they are vile to God, that he can't look upon them, I'd like for you to grab me after service and point it out for me, please. That comedian, Pete Holmes, he also says, not only does God not forgive us, he doesn't even acknowledge that we left on the walk. Instead of saying to us when we return and we pay attention, he doesn't say to us, hey, I'll tell you what, I'll kill this person instead of you. No, it's more like, I'm not even sure what you're talking about, but let's keep going. Now we're back at judgment. There's a song that would never translate, so I'm going to read it as poetry to you. Um, it's by the band Thrice. Dustin Kensrue is one of my favorite musicians in the world. He was a worship leader at a large church in California and also the lead singer of a punk band uh, that had pretty good national success. And he wrote this song called For Miles. And it, it's funny, I, I love this song because I love the message in it. And it stems from, I always work backwards, I'm always negative. There's another song similar to it that's really popular that a lot of you may know that's uh, about walking a mile in someone's shoes that I can't, I cannot stand that song. And I've never liked that song and I finally figured out why. It's because of the righteous tone that comes from the song. Like it just is, yeah, it, anyway. Um, so the Thrice song for Miles goes like this. I know one day all our scars will disappear like the stars at dawn. And all of our pain will fade away when morning comes. 
And on that day, when we look backwards, we will see that everything has changed and all of our trials will be as milestones on the way. And as long as we live, every scar is a bridge to someone's broken heart. And there's no greater love than that one shed his blood for his friends. On that day, all of the scales will swing to set all the wrongs to right. All of our tears, all of our fears will take to flight. But until then, all of our scars will still remain. We've learned that if we'll open the wounds and share them, then soon they start to heal. And as long as we live, every scar is a bridge to someone's broken heart. There's no greater love. Shed your blood for your friends, and there's no greater love than that one shed his blood for his friends. We must see that every scar is a bridge, and as long as we live, we must open up these wounds. When someone stands in your shoes and will shed his own blood, there's no greater love. We must open up our wounds. We do that here. We do that in life. We do that together. We open the wounds. We live honestly at the foot of the cross and we bathe in the righteousness that washes over us. And that's judgment. <laughs> It's not Jules type judgment, but it's judgment. Heather had this vision or thought, whatever it was, that occurred to her during our Ash Wednesday service, which was on Valentine's Day this year. As she sat in worshipful reflection, she just heard clearly, this is what it's about. This quiet time together. This is what it's about. And she thought about the question, what do I get for coming to church? Because we do that mental negotiation with ourselves, with God. Eh, do I go to church? Do I not go to church? It's really easy to be online. Sorry, online people. I'm glad that you're here with us. Um, but do I go? Do I not go? What do I do? What do I get if I go? Maybe they're having lunch, but is it going to be good? Is it just going to be pizza again? Or is it going to be something I really like? Or... Um, and she just wondered about that. And I thought about it in terms of Valentine's Day. And I thought, oh my gosh, imagine. Okay, so I've already got you a card that someone else wrote and manufactured. I already got you flowers that someone else grew, picked, and assembled, right? And so now, if, if you ask me, you want to go to dinner? And I say, hmm, what do you suppose I'll get out of that? Like, maybe. I might, I might want to go to dinner, but what's the negotiation here? Yeah, it'd probably be your last Valentine's Day uh, together with someone for a little while. But not only is God walking with us always, hoping that we will walk with him, he is inviting us to be at his table together, koinonia. And so on the night before he was betrayed by his friends, he broke bread saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup and said, this is my, make sure I get the right color. He wasn't concerned about the colors of the cups, but he said, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink all of you in remembrance, remembrance of me. Think about that van with all those body parts that Peter didn't use, but he showed you last week. <laughs> In remembrance of me. He literally opened up his wounded body and shed his blood for his friends. And here's the good news. You're all his friends. At the sanctuary, we're all invited to the Lord's table. You can come forward, take a piece of the bread, dip it in the wine. The dark cups are wine, the blue cups are juice. And remember his broken body as you do. As you partake, be still and hear him say, just remember, I love you. And it'll be all right. Well, Peter Hyatt said last week that life is a test. 
so that we can find out what God has done and it's, is always doing, a test to help us know God is love, and then freely surrender to that love. And I believe that too. But who in here loves tests? Anybody in school, you, you said, hey, I, I want more tests, more tests. Can we go to standardized, standardized, standardized testing and test the testing? I want to test my testing. Nobody, nobody. So while I believe that, I'm going to push back a little on that idea. And I believe that Peter believes this too, that life is more than just a test. Life is a calling to a shared experience, koinonia, a walk with God that results in a walk with others. It's a koinonia. We are associates in God's love. We're associates in God's redemption in his righteousness. So spread it around. In Jesus' name, be the gospel. Amen.